and welcome to another episode of America's Future series is Space Talks with Z. I'm Z. How are you doing? Uh, thank you to our sponsors for making this uh, possible. And today with us, we have uh, Laura seward Forchick, a consultant, a author, and most of all, a space professional. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Laura, for joining us today. Uh, Laura has uh, multiple degrees in uh, technical fields, uh, starting with uh, BS in astronomy, a master's in physics, and a, a PhD in planetary science. So she comes from the technical side of the house, uh, kind of like me. Um, so if we geek out, pardon us. Uh, but you know what we're going to be talking about in general today is a wider discussion about being a space professional, um, what it takes to get there, and what the future uh, means for for uh, workforce, for talent. Um, and so I'd love to turn it over to you, Laura, um, if you could perhaps uh, introduce yourself in your own words. Yeah, it's a pleasure for, uh, thank you for having me on. It's a pleasure to be on. And I am um, very glad we're talking about this subject because it's really a passion of mine to encourage the next generation. Um, I remember when I was a student and I really could have used a lot of advice and guidance and, and there are a lot of people who helped me so I try to give back as much as possible. Um, and, I, and I feel like the nature of our space sector is changing such that we need more people of more diversity ever than ever before. And so this is a really important topic close to my heart. Awesome. So can you perhaps tell us a little bit about your personal journey to space? And, and kind of the, how you ended up choosing to pivot a from, from being a, t a scientist and a technologist to kind of looking at the economics and the, and the human aspects of it. Sure, yes. Yeah. So I have been a space geek since I was a kid. Uh, like many children, I, I wanted to be an astronaut. I remember learning about the Apollo missions and wanting to go to the moon and I still want to go to the moon. So um, NASA, I volunteer. And so um, when I was a kid, I grew up with science fiction. My parents were really big science fiction fans. I grew up watching science fiction, reading science fiction. It was a big part of my childhood and my parents really supported me. Um, they sent me to space camp in Huntsville, Alabama. Um, I actually went six times. <laughs> so wow. I was pretty hooked. Um, my parents bought me a telescope. Yes, yeah. Um, I am a total geek. Um, and and I loved it. And then when it came to figuring out what to do with my university education, I decided to pursue astrophysics because the pictures like the one behind me, which is just gorgeous, absolutely beautiful. I wanted to understand how the universe was formed and all these different cosmic phenomena that we have out there. And I was decently good at physics and math. So um, I decided to just go for it and major in astrophysics. So my first two degrees are in astrophysics. And um, I, I loved working with the, the space telescopes, I, I did a lot of data analysis with various telescopes that are in space, um, which was just really exciting to me <laughs> that I was taking data that we captured from space observatories and analyzing on the ground to figure out things like gamma ray bursts and all these other mysterious phenomena that we see in space. But I don't like coding, which is a mm -hmm. big problem when you're um, working with computers and it's such a, a computationally intensive field. I don't like coding at all. So I wanted to switch over to something more with my hands, um, but I didn't want to be an engineer. That wasn't really my, um, my, my thought process is more of a scientist than an engineer. So I switched over to something called experimental planetary science, where we did experiments in a lab trying to simulate planetary science, um, planetary formation, planetary ring formation, wow. and dynamics, specifically focusing on moon, Mars, and asteroids. So dusty environments in space and how do they react to perturbations, impacts, um, especially slow impacts, which isn't as exciting as the fast impacts, but still as important. If you're talking about landing things on the surface of the moon, for example, what happens to that surface? You know, what kind of plume effects are there? What kind of ejecta comes out and ruins your surrounding environment, for example? Um, really important questions uh, that are very practical now that we're thinking about going back to the moon um, you know, with landers, such as 
as the landers that we've seen um, with China's most recent uh, experiment that just came back, but also um, future commercial landers that NASA is sending and other international partners are sending, um, you know, uncrewed landers, and then in the future, human missions as well. So very important topics. When I was in graduate school, I learned more about the space industry, ways to make, um, you know, money separate from the government. So right. traditionally, space is always a partnership between commercial companies and government, where the government has issued contracts to commercial companies to um, build uh, assets that are more for the government's operations um, to the government specifications. And that has been changing over the past decade or two, where now you're seeing, especially with NASA, broadening their scope of buying services from commercial companies. And um, really the, the regulations in the United States are opening up such that um, commercial companies can um, try to make a business, whether it's in Earth orbit or in cislunar space or on the moon, um, is some of the out there ideas of asteroid mining and what else can you do in the deep, deep space. Um, so there's some really great opportunities there. So I started really diving into that in graduate school, as well as space policy. I started to get involved in national and um, local space policy. I lived in Florida at the time, which is a space hub. So there's quite a lot of space policy that goes on in the state of Florida, as well as on a national scale and then international space policy as well. Very, very interesting. Um, so I, I started to um, broaden. Um, and that's more me. I am the generalist. I'm not a specialist. I knew I wasn't going to stay in academia because I couldn't specialize. I couldn't stay still. I really love um, the intersections of multiple disciplines, the way that um, science crosses over with ethics, that crosses over with um, space law and space policy and business practices and how it all inter overlaps and, and interconnects in ways that a lot of people don't think about. And, and I don't know how much more you want me to go into, but um, for the past five years, I, after um, leaving the university, I um, got a position in a nonprofit that handles International Space Station research for NASA that deals with the betterment of life on Earth. Wow. It's called CASIS, the Center for the Advancement of Science and Space, which is also called the, International, the ISS National Lab. Um, and from there, I got hired uh, on as the manager of Florida operations for a small startup based in Switzerland that wanted to have offices all across the world to create a way to um, carry people very quickly across the globe doing suborbital space. But space companies don't make it, not all of them. Um, sometimes they, they crash and burn, unfortunately, and this one was one that went bankrupt. And so for the past five years, almost, I have um, been running my own company, Astrolytical, doing space industry, space policy, and space science analysis. So you touch on a lot of things, and I think that's a great framework for, for the rest of our discussion here. Um, one, one thing, you've become a leading voice in the need to integrate the space technology from kind of government and pure defense, not that that's not critical, but to expand beyond that into more societal applications and how to bring the human side of it. And your book, The Rise of, uh, Rise of the Space Age Millennials, you know, you outline um, the perspectives and uh, the, this you, you go through this amazing, you know, a millennials panel as you, as you term it. Um, uh, with over a hundred millennials to and really help us understand the perspective, uh, about, you know. And it seems like people feel spaces within their reach in a way that's very different from from the 1960s, where people were excited and inspired by it, but it wasn't something everybody could aspire to. And that seems to have changed. Can you can you elaborate on on some of your key findings um, in, in your research that led to the book? Yeah, you're absolutely correct. A lot has changed since the 1960s and 70s. So back when the space age began, um, it was really a government operation. Um, there wasn't really much uh, foresight to think that commercial companies would get involved. And because it was a bit of a space race, mostly between the United States and the Soviet Union, there were, there were other players and other things going on as well. But that was the big incentive was this governmental um, kind of Cold War um, one-upmanship. Um, so that made it a government operation that had all the motivation of um, 
beating another country to certain milestones where the Russians got the first astronaut into space, the United States planted the first astronauts and the you know, flag on the moon. Um, so there were other milestones in there as well, but that appealed to a certain demographic and only certain uh, type of person was allowed to be in the astronaut corps in the United States at that point. So it was um, white men of military background, except for one geologist that got chosen on later Apollo mission. So it was a very narrow subset of humanity. And then uh, the, the Russian, the Soviet Union side, it was it was much the same. There was one female cosmonaut and, and, and then there was a, a long gap between the next female cosmonaut. So it was a very narrow subset of people who were deemed worthy of being chosen to go. There was a group of women called the Mercury 13 right. who went through the same kind of testing as official ones. And in some cases, those Mercury 13 women, they did better than, than some of the male astronauts, but right. they um, were ultimately not chosen because they got qualified as fighter pilots because at that time women could not be fighter pilots. So um, it, it was just a barrier. And that's not even to mention the, the fact that it was only white uh, Americans and, and not even necessarily anyone else to consider. Um, and, and it took some time for there to be an opening of who we might consider to be an astronaut and who we might be considered to be allowed in the space program in general. And that term space program also points to a limitation because it was just the government space program and it, it didn't even like couldn't even imagine that there'd be a space industry as, as a, you know a multiple space programs throughout many countries and and multiple industries that over, like that aren't even necessarily space companies but still operate or use space in some way or another so there's been quite a broadening and the millennial panel that you mentioned that I interviewed for my book over 100 millennials um they gave quite a different perspective than the 1960s perspective. You still hear a lot of government officials today talking about American first, American leadership, um, you know, making it very nationalistic. And when you're talking to politicians, that is their primary concern, that taxpayer dollars are used to promote American um, you know, ideals and goals and objectives for American security, American supremacy, like all these terms that you hear that are still very common today. But if you're talking to um, millennials and younger, um, what their thought process is for the future of space, it is not nationalistic, it's international. A lot of partnerships, a lot of international collaborations, especially talking on the science side. If we're talking about space science, it is already very international. It has always been quite international. There aren't really science, not, not national boundaries. So you can talk about language barriers or even um, legal barriers, such as the United States not legally being allowed to work with China, except in um, certain circumstances where Congress approves. So there are some barriers in place, but it's not um, mentally speaking, it's not there in the millennial mindset that there should be barriers. And then when you're talking about companies, commercial companies, those are by nature, able to operate internationally. So for example, there's a company on the International Space Station called NanoRax who has been able to work with Chinese partners getting around this idea that China can't operate with the United States. And I bring that up just it's such an, an obvious uh, barrier right now that these um, companies and scientists can work around. And so when you're talking to millennials, it's not about national pride. It's, it's more about um, the possibilities of where we as a humanity, as a planet, can come together and progress space in the future. And it, it doesn't necessarily need to stop at certain borders. It can be a collaboration of many, and it should necessarily be a collaboration of many different international partners and public-private partnerships. Another thing you mentioned in your book that um, is a theme we've heard from some of our other guests is the democratization of space. That it's not just about big budgets, but it's, as you mentioned, you know, there are a lot of startups. Um, and so how do you feel the, the mindset of millennials is different in regards to their access to space versus uh, previous generations? And what do you see as the possibilities uh, and or repercussions of that moving forward? Yeah, so when you're talking about millennials access to space, our modern world takes for granted that we have access to space and we don't usually think about it. The GPS satellites and other navigation and time precision satellites up there that have been up there for, for just a few decades now that we take for granted that we can access 
you know, navigation on our phone or the perfect timing of financial transactions. We just take it for granted. Um, our cell phones are always attached to us now. Um, and millennials just take for granted that we have access to it. Now, we didn't grow up necessarily. Now, some millennials on the younger side did grow up with um, you know, having smartphones since they were infants. Um, but uh, older, on the older side, millennials didn't necessarily have smartphones until they were um, older children or even into adulthood. And so there's a, a bit of a gap there in terms of how people think about accessibility. But currently, the way that millennials operate and the way that the workforce is, is tending to operate, and I wrote this book before the coronavirus brought us into this remote working situation, um, but the way that things are trending is that we are always online and that there's not necessarily even acknowledgement about what um, country you're in that you're talking to. So I actually don't know what state you're in right now but only based on the collaboration of time zones does it even matter to me, right? And that tends to be how millennials think. Unless you're working in a field where there's ITAR restrictions or some other um, sensitivity that you need to be aware of who you're talking to, then most millennials just don't worry about who necessarily they're talking to. They might think of it as more of an interest or a way to, you know, partner up with time zones if you're across the country, across the world, and you need to sync with somebody on a completely different time zone. But millennials just don't think about it because access to the internet is constant. You can be, you know, an early morning person at 5 a.m. or you can be a late, late, late night person at 2 a.m. texting or talking or emailing to somebody might be in the same time zone as you, might be across the world, and you won't necessarily know it unless you you know, want to find that information out or need to find that information out. So that's the way that the mindset is changing, is that we take for granted that a lot of this has happened because of the internet. And internet is, you know, fibers under the sea, but it's also satellites that provide this connectivity um, when you're on and you're in some kind of remote location um, and more and more you're seeing these um, Leo constellations popping up, whether it's right. SpaceX and Starlink or some of the many others that might be popping up as well, which there's been satellite internet for a while now, but Leo um, brings it so that it brings it closer to the surface so that there's less of a delay, there's less latency. Um, so um, that's where you're seeing the shift change is that we just take for granted that we're always going to be connected and it doesn't matter when you're connected, it doesn't matter where you are, that's what we take for granted. And, and of course it isn't completely that way. Um, my internet connection here, even though I'm in the suburbs of a major city, isn't that great. Uh, but um, it is getting to be more and more like that. Very interesting. Now you touched on another uh, subject there in terms of millennials have this perspective um, that certain things are taken for granted. So, so another uh, another thing you're becoming very well known for is career coaching um, in in space and also to to help companies understand how to get the right talent in in um, in the space uh, economy. Uh, given that they're now needing to hire millennials and basically moving forward, that's who they're going to be hiring. Um, so, you know, and you're doing that partly, uh, you know, uh, um, as a consultant and also as, as founder of Astrolytical. How do you, how do you approach the concept of, of mapping a career through the space economy for somebody um, who is, is entering in, in these very interesting circumstances now with COVID, but even before that, in an era when, when so much of this is just, you know, it's, at, it, it's right, everything's within reach now. Um, how what how do you how do we frame for our for our viewers how would you frame thinking about this yeah i love the diversity of the clientele that i have the people who come to me who aren't necessarily the traditional STEM majors. I myself am a scientist, but you do not need to be a scientist. You do not need to be an engineer to work in space. And I absolutely love the diversity that I'm able to bring to show these people is because when I was a student, I was told that there was like one path to get to space. I was told actually I needed to switch majors from um, you know astrophysics to aerospace engineering, which isn't true. Um, it wasn't true then, it isn't true now, but the, the beauty of being where I am in my career and seeing so many people, seeing so many paths is that I can show other people how they can get from where they are, whether they're working already in some unrelated field or whether they're a student trying to figure out how to get to where they 
I can show them a path, whether it's an engineering path or whether it's a scientific path or whether it is a path like uh, journalism or a, a something completely different like fashion. Um, there are so many different ways to enter the space sector. And for each person, it is completely different. Maybe they have some great idea and they just don't know how to implement it. Maybe they just love space and they want to figure out how they can use their background and knowledge. Um, do they need to go back to school? Maybe, maybe not. Do they need to, um, you know, get some kind of entry level job? Maybe, maybe not. Do they need, maybe they start their own business? Maybe not. So there's so many different ways, so many different paths. And the beauty about the commercial space industry is that it opens up those paths. Previously, um, there were only so many jobs. When you're talking about government space agencies um, within the United States, there's the government agencies, you know, NASA, the Department of Defense, um, you know, there, there are a few others that hire space related people. Um, but there's only so many of those government positions. So with the space sector opening up and private money flowing in, that opens it up to a wide diversity of talent that wasn't previously necessarily able to get in. And it doesn't necessarily even need to be Americans. If you're talking you know, you're talking about Rocket Lab is an American company operating in New Zealand. You know, there's there's so many different ways to get involved. And I'm I'm speaking mostly to Americans because that is the, the focus of you know your your series. But um, there's so many other companies around the world that are popping up, especially in Asia, that is quite a growing area. India may very soon be a very growing area. Um, Europe, I know, is trying to grow their space industry. They're space industry and there are a significant number of um, countries that are creating their own space agencies you know national space agencies as well so there's so much opportunity around the world so no matter where somebody is once they contact me I'm able to at least help them identify some possibilities based on where they are and where they want to go and, and I, I feel like it's an important service because when I was a student I really could have used that a bit more um, I, I was told some you know, straight narrow path and I was given some bad advice in the past and I other people to know that they've got more options than they realize. Well, that's that's really that's important and a, a work. I'm sure the results are are quite amazing. Um, you know, you you talk about diversity and how space is fundamentally international, and and that's a, a really interesting point. Um, but within that, you know, there's a moment right now um, in in history where where there's there, there's a there's diversity not just of of, of multinational um, uh, people uh, individuals but also um, an emphasis on on equity uh, for for women and uh, what I wanted to ask you about is in line with the thought process of, of how you would coach somebody with uh, being becoming a space professional how would you feel uh, being a woman affected your experience and perspective on creating a space career and and how do you how would you pay that forward in, in terms of advice to, to other uh, young people? Yeah, I frequently talk about my experiences as a woman, um, which as a student, obvious. It wasn't until I got into my career that it became much more obvious that um, I was looked at differently because I was a minority gender. Um, and I unfortunately had several encounters. I couldn't even tell you how many encounters with men that were um, inappropriate, you know, especially men in power who tend to not know the limits or not care in the moment about the limits that they should have in a professional setting. And so I do try to warn um, other women that they might experience this as unfortunate and unfair as it is, and that don't take it personally. And for some women, I've seen it drive them away. I've seen some people leave the industry because of sexual harassment or some other inappropriate behavior. And that's really, really unfortunate that we're still dealing with this in the year 2020. Um, and so I really try to help women ex um, show them that they belong. And I myself am a mother and I'm very open about the fact that I'm a mother because I want to show, um, you know, whoever it is who is a mother or will become a mother, maybe wants to become a mother, that they too belong. And when you're talking about equality and diversity, it's not just about gender. And it's about so many different aspects. It's about, you know, it is about gender. It's also about, you know, race and it's about ethnicity and it's about, um, you know, background of so many different, you know, religion. I really try to open it up to everybody and speak to everybody because space is for everybody. And when you're talking about, you know, space being fundamentally international, we sometimes forget that we are on a planet 
hurling through space. We are all in space in an aspect that we are on this planet Earth together. The space is not only inherently global, it, it, we, we are on a globe in space. Um, so you can't have those artificial boundaries and think that you're going to have a healthy environment to expand outwards into space, whether that is you know just orbit, which we have been doing for several decades now, or hopefully expanding out to the moon, expanding to Mars, and wherever else we go. We need to look forward in the way that we want to represent ourselves as humanity. And that's why I think it's really like the Artemis uh, program that NASA right. is making sure they emphasize that it is, you know, maybe their wording isn't quite right here. I don't think it is, but um, they want to emphasize that they're not just sending white men and they're not just sending Americans. Um, just recently, they had announced yesterday a Canadian is going to be joining the Artemis II mission. Right. And um, I, I know yesterday also they talked about maybe it won't be one man, one woman on the Artemis three mission landing on the moon. It might be two women. I mean, they're really opening it up to whatever it happens to be that we can really say, you know, space globally is more than just white American men. Not that there's anything wrong with white American men, but there's more than that. And we need to make sure that we are um, promoting the people who could become the next, you know, uh, Neil Armstrong to land on Mars, you know, to right. um, and, and I think that we're doing a decently good job now, but I think there's a lot more to be done. It's very interesting to, to hear you, you sp speak about that, given uh, my personal, personally, uh, more than half of my mentors have been, uh, have been women. And I had the privilege of uh, meeting um, Michelle Nichols, uh, famously Lieutenant Uhura, um, on, on Star Trek, the original series, who helped recruit the first uh, cohorts of African-American um, uh, astronauts, of which one was Charlie Bolden, who then eventually went on to, to become uh, administrator. And, you know, um, a few years ago, I also had the opportunity to meet a, a assistant administrator, Dava Newman, but we haven't had a female administrator yet. So perhaps that's uh, you know soon to soon to come about, um, perhaps from this coming class of Artemis astronauts. Uh, certainly would you know they're certainly qualified. Um, but now you know it's interesting to have that discussion. What do you feel are concrete things? Because part of what we want to do at America's Future Series is not be shy about saying this is what we should do moving forward. This needs to be done. So I, I know I'm putting you on the spot a little bit, but but I, I do want to ask you because I'm I'm sure you've thought about this, and it, it, your response is going to be very well reasoned. What are concrete actions companies and governments can take to make the space ecosystem um, more diverse, more inclusive, and more equitable? I think it comes to um, individual acknowledgement that you and I and everybody is biased in some way. Um, and it's just based on the society that we grew up in. So even though I am a woman, I am sexist because of the society that I grew up in is sexist. That's just the way that our brains have been taught. And we need to unpack some of those internal biases and recognize them. Um, it wasn't until I had a special needs child that I recognized that I am ableist. And so there are different ways of unpacking the internal ableism that is inside of my head. Same with racism, same with all these other isms. And so as individuals, um, whether we have a hiring responsibility or not, can really unpack our own biases and recognize, am I leaving anyone out? Am I excluding someone? Or, or am I unfairly promoting someone because they're my buddy or they look like me or they are, I'm used to them, I'm, they're familiar to me, um, they're a safe option. Why do you have this mentality? Um, thinking about the teams that we put together, um, I know that I called out a team a couple years ago. Um, it was a university team, a significant number of um, white males in this university rocket team. And I said, where are the women? And they said, well, no women wanted to be part of it. And I, I, I'm like, red flags, red flags. That is not true. It's something about that group dynamics or the, the um, you know, the perception that is driving away any women or, or any people of color that might have joined that group. And so I don't even remember what university that was, but hopefully they've thought about that since then. But these are the ways you look at who's involved and you look at who's being included, you look at who's being promoted, you look at the awards that are being given and you really look, was the, the limited pool because it's truly limited, the, the candidate pool, or was it because we left people out? 
was there so few talk submissions by um, you know, gender minorities or racial minorities because there's not that many or because we didn't reach out to them and let them know about this opportunity or because we didn't let them know that they are qualified for this opportunity and should apply. There have been studies done about, um, you know, that women tend to not apply for things unless they check every box where men, and it's just generalities, but men tend to apply even if they don't check every box and um, those kinds of things to look for. Um, and, and it's not necessarily uh, the responsibility of governments, although governments can help. It's not the responsibility necessarily of um, you know companies, although companies can certainly do quite a bit to help. Mm. I think it's the responsibility of every one of us to look at our interactions with other people, the, the teams that we are in, um, any kind of activities that we might be leaving someone out or promoting promoting somebody up and see where we can do a better job. Well, thank you for that. And I think that last point in particular is so important because we often look to authority to fix things for us rather than owning it ourselves. Um, it's funny you mentioned isms. Uh, I don't remember who made the quip. The only ism I believe in is pragmatism. Uh, and we, we certainly saw that with, uh, with the Vanderbilt football team a couple weeks ago where due to COVID, they lost their kicker. So they drafted the, uh, the um, goalie from, from the uh, 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 ladies soccer team who could kick farther than the, than the guys. And you know what? She first a woman to score uh, points uh, in, in the NCAA Div 1 football game. So it's, it's very interesting how, how, how circumstances that challenge us perhaps uh, force us to acknowledge that some of these barriers and biases are truly just in our minds. There's no reason that they should exist. Um, and, and when we're pressed to it, literally pressed against not being able to, uh, to accomplish our goals, we, we are forced to realize that it was nonsense. Um, and and I, it's interesting. I mean, do you, do you feel that, that, space, that the extremes that we find in space where, where literally the, the, the ability, for example, you mentioned the Mercury 13. I believe um, one of the Mercury 13 still to this day holds the re a record for the longest time in the water tank. Uh, if I'm correct. Yeah, um, that Wally um, that's right. She's fantastic. Um, so I'm writing a second book right now on space tourism and private space flight, and I had the honor of interviewing her, and she wow. already. No, like she's been wanting to go for decades to this day. Um, she wants to go up on Virgin Galactic or whatever company will allow her to go. Um, and so when you're talking about isms, you know, we look at age too. Um, so she was excluded because of her gender. Will she be excluded or included because of her age? Are there going to be certain physical limitations? When you talk about um, how can we be more inclusive in space, you know, when you're talking about physically going up in space, um, I know Stephen Hawking was going to go up into space, but he passed away before he was able so he did do a, a zero g corporation parabolic flight um and, and it's those kinds of things why are we leaving certain people out you mean they can't go maybe we need to look at certain uh exclusions that we just take for granted and, and peel them apart and see if they really need to be exclusions and and circling and circling back to um to to some of what you wrote in in your book it uh one of the things you you particularly mentioned is that millennials are motivated very different, differently, um, and that their their why is fundamentally different than the previous why for 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 people in in the space economy, um, in in space technology. Um, do you, how do you see that translating into into inclusivity um, and and development? Yeah, that's an excellent question, and it's going to be dependent on. Um, the people in charge, not necessarily the people in charge now, but the people who become in charge in the future, um, how we decide to open up. And I think that millennials are doing a great job. I think Generation Z is going to do an even better job. <laughs> so that's the next generation after millennials. Millennials are in our 20s and 30s. Generation Z are the ones coming on board now in their teens and, and um, early 20s and, 
and I'm not, there's no fine break yet. So they have even more of a mindset of inclusivity. So when you're talking about the future leaders, I think the leadership that we have, um, you know, a couple of decades in the next few decades will really help us to determine how we move forward with inclusivity in the space sector, whether we're talking about human space flight or whether we're talking about satellites or data. Um, you know, data science is another area where there are um, implicit biases written into code. Right. And we see that with machine learning and AI. And, and it's, it's, these are all these areas that um, we know that there are problems and we need to fix these problems. And it's up to leadership and, and funding agencies to prioritize those problems to make sure that we fix them um, and not leave anybody out. So, you know, we've, we've talked uh, about a variety of things. We've talked about um, the need for, for commerce versus just government funded space and how that transition is happening, how the, the generational transitions are going to shape the space economy. Um, there's a universe, pardon the pun, of possibilities out there for people. Um, what specific advice would you give a young person considering a space career right now? Um, you know, a, a middle schooler, a high schooler, a, co a college um, student, and then beyond. How should they be thinking yeah. about how to craft their path? This is one of my favorite questions because it's it's so open. Um, when I was a student, I was taught that you had to be an engineer or you had to be a scientist to go into space. But for the students I speak to now, I tell them how open it is. Um, a lot of times students are discouraged because they don't feel like they fit a certain mold. Um, but there's so many different paths and it might be a job that hasn't even been imagined yet. That is a job that they will get a chance to be or get a chance to create in the future. And um, the beauty of space is that it's an open canvas. Uh, we will write on it or paint on it, depending on what we create. And that could be something that is, uh, you know, the next fantastic application that will take over the world and, and create uh, billions of dollars, you know, or it could be just something that changes humanity for the better. And you need all those different types of mindsets to think that through. Um, so you don't wanna leave anybody out. If someone has a passion about space, they don't need to fit a certain mold. They don't need to um, be an engineer if they don't want to be, although they certainly can be. They don't need to, um, you know, they don't need to go to a certain school even. They could go, <laughs> I keep going, I go back to fashion because that's one of my favorites because people think fashion, but you could go to into, um, you know, Fashion Institute of Technology if you wanted to and go learn how to design spacesuits or figure out the fabric that you need to create for parachutes. I mean, there's so many different ways that you can get involved in space that um, a lot of students just don't recognize because for so long it'd been closed off. Another thing that I'd like to tell students is don't let anyone discourage them. Um, you don't need to be a straight A student. I was not a straight A student. I struggled. I have uh, a certain neuro uh, <laughs> that um, makes it so that I don't remember uh, certain numbers and equations. And I, I never got you know the perfect score on my physics tests ever. <laughs> so it's one of those things where I did fine because I pursued it and you know persevered. So don't let anyone think you, that you don't belong, and don't let anyone convince you that you don't belong. It might be. Uh, a parent who isn't supportive or it might be um, a teacher or an authority figure who isn't supportive. It might even be a professor. And you have those classes that are weed out classes that I totally disagree with, but it might be a professor that tells you that you don't belong. Well, you do belong. And those are the ones that have the problem. Those, those professors or teachers or, or parental, you know, whoever it is that's telling you don't belong, they don't know you and they don't know your path. So if it is an area that you want to pursue, go pursue it and just ignore the naysayers. And you might need to find a different path. If someone is blocking you, you might need to go around them. And that might be you know, unfair and, a, and an extra hardship, um, but it might still be your path forward to where you want to go. And so there's so many different ways. And I just encourage people to not give up and don't ask permission necessarily. Um, that was a problem that I had as a student. I thought I needed to raise my hand and ask permission to go do something. But really, if you're passionate about it, go learn about it. You've got the internet at your fingertips. You can go learn about anything you want from a reliable source um, and then go do it. If you wanna get involved in a project, if you wanna go you know, look at the stars, if you, if you wanna learn something, just go dive in. Don't think that you have to ask permission from a parent or a teacher or whoever, just go do it. And you'll find ways to get involved if you, um, you know, it, not everyone has the ability to do this. I understand my own implicit, um, pre uh, you know, my privileges that I have an internet connection, um, that I have the ability right. to speak 
English well, you know, there's a lot of barriers that are there. Um, but for most students, they have some ability to connect with the outside world that they can dive into their own studies and, and really try to pursue. Um, maybe it's a club that they join, um, you know, stargazing or amateur rocketry or something that they can get involved in and not let anyone stop them. You know, uh, thank you for that. Um, I think there are a lot of people who are going to hear that and, and be encouraged. Uh, and, and, you know, uh, find a way to keep going. It's funny, it, oftentimes, uh, I forget who said it, uh, history doesn't necessarily repeat itself, but it has a rhythm. And, th you know, your, what you said reminds me of, of Marcus Aurelius' uh, phrase, yeah, um, that, uh, that uh, which is in the way becomes the way. And perhaps that's the way we have to think about this. Uh, more often than not. So, you know, we're, we're coming to the end of the hour and I want to ask you, Laura, what is next for you? You mentioned another book. Um, and what else? Yeah, thank you. I'm excited about this book. It should be out by the end of 2021. It doesn't have a name yet. So I <laughs> keep, <laughs> I keep uh, looking for it. Uh, I'll name it eventually, but I've interviewed at this point, 17 flown astronauts and 10 future flyers on their perspectives wow. about space flight, how to prepare for space flight, what surprised them about their space flights, um, all because I write the books that I want, wish other people had written and they haven't, so I write it. Um, you know, I wanted to know the millennial perspective, so I wrote that book. I wanted to know how best to prepare for private space, so I'm writing the book. Um, I'm also working on a project with Astrolytical Internally that will be diving into certain areas of the space sector and analyzing it and putting it out there um, more generally for people to really understand um, you know, how to think critically about certain areas of the space sector that I feel like doesn't have enough skepticism. <laughs> it's just taken for granted as hype. Um, hype is important, but hype with critical thinking is where you right. want to go. It's the balance sure. there. Um, so that'll be in January, a series of um, reports that people can purchase or subscribe to. Um, also working on an update to the book that you mentioned, The Rise of the Space Age Millennials. I will be putting out an update that in involves Generation Z perspectives. So interviewing... Uh -huh younger people who were too young for my first edition of the book. They were still minors, but now that um, Generation Z are becoming adults, uh, I can include their perspectives as well. Um, and I don't know what else is going to bring for the next year. I don't know if we're going to go back to travel. I certainly hope so. I definitely miss seeing my colleagues and friends in person. Um, but hopefully I will meet you someday in person, get a chance to go to some of these hopefully. space conferences again. And uh, I, I'm very excited to go see launches again. That is something I very much miss. It's a thrill, isn't it? You know, uh, it's funny you mentioned uh, hopefully there's travel. Well, there's so as far as we know, there's no COVID in space. So that's one safe destination, I suppose. Um, you know, Laura, thank you so much. Uh, I think, uh, you know, um, again, uh, our, uh, the book is uh, Rise of the Space Age Millennials. I'm just gonna share my, uh, my, my, my screen uh, to be able to show people that. Um, it is a, I think from my perspective, this should be required reading for, for current uh, space executives because it's gonna help you understand your workforce. Uh, and, the, and they do think differently. Believe me, I know as a, as a senior manager <laughs> who's looking at uh, hiring uh, people in, in their 20s, uh, it is a different perspective. Uh, and understanding that perspective is gonna help us understand as, as leadership how to, how to get what we need done, um, get the best outcomes, and moving forward, uh, create the next generation of space leaders. So uh, thank you very much again, uh, uh, Laura, for joining us, uh, folks. Uh, Laura Seward Forchik uh, of Astrolytical, uh, author of Rise of the Space Age Millennials. Uh, and you know, I would like to, on behalf of America's Future Series and uh, Space Talks, uh, thank you again and thank our sponsors. Take care, everyone. Uh, we look forward to you joining us on the next uh, episode.